Well, hello, Orange County. How are you? I brought out some papers here because my very first uh, high school graduation, when I was the principal, I put some papers on the podium and they got shuffled around and I had a wing in for about 10 minutes. So I, always, I bring my papers with me now. So as you can see, creativity, chaos and contradictions in the millennial classroom. We as educators really, really want to, we really want to teach creativity. We want our kids to be creative. We take very seriously the LinkedIn statement that creativity is the number one thing that job uh, reviewers are asking for, job uh, recruiters are asking for. We believe it's the number one thing that is going on in California now and really around the country. But can we teach it in the schools? What does it mean to teach creativity in the schools? And in fact, is creativity teachable at all? I think it's a very important question that's got some surprising answers. The final answer is yes, I think it is. But there's a lot of twists and turns along the way that we're going to get to. So me, Don K. Harris, um, recently I just completed in December of 2021 eight years on the California Arts Council. I was appointed by Governor Brown in 2013. At that point, we had $3 million to work with the entire state of California. If you do the math, that's less than a dime a person, I think. We're now up to about a dollar a person, which was our goal all along. It's about $40 million and actually a little bit more with Governor Newsom's a couple of new plans that he's got but we're seeing a great resurgence throughout the state. Anybody in this audience has ever been a recipient of a California Arts Council grant at any time since 1976? Well, congratulations, I see a few hands were up. Many people will tell you that their arts career began with a small grant, maybe it's 1980s from the California Arts Council. We're very proud of that tradition. We celebrated 40 years during the time that I was chair in Sacramento and saw a lot of the folks came out from way back when. It was quite a scene in 1977 when Jerry Brown opened it up. Uh, it's a little, a little more corporate now, and maybe it needs to be. Um, after that, well, alongside that, I was the director of creativity in the San Francisco Unified Schools for those three years as we tried to get a big project off the ground that unfortunately was a little bit waylaid by COVID, as you can imagine. But we had a $300 million art center for the whole city that we were trying to do. And it may happen eventually, but it didn't happen then. I retired after that. And prior to that, I had been the principal of the Ruth Asawa School of the Arts in San Francisco and the executive director of the Oakland School for the Arts um, in Oakland, right across the bay. And those were two wonderful schools. Those of you who know the Orange County School of the Arts here, it, those are the best schools in public education, in my thinking. They're so creative, the community is involved, and there's great, great importance that everybody places on those. Do people know OSHA here? Are people familiar with the school? Yeah, really great place. I don't know if Ralph Opasek is here today, but he was a good friend of mine for many years. Ralph's quite a guy, and um, Orange County's got a lot going into the arts, particularly in the schools. Prior to my leaving the California Arts Council, we created a strategic framework, strategic plan, that we called Creative Impact. And that's what we wanted to have in California, was a creative impact. We wanted there to be a sense of belonging for all folks, so palpable that it is universally experienced by all. We want to build a race equity culture that requires attention and effort to do because if we just want something, we talk about it, it doesn't usually happen. We have to really be, as it says here, equity is a noun crying out for a verb. It has to be paired with a verb. Rhetoric is one thing. We need the rhetoric. We also need direct action. And today I'm going to talk a lot about the relationship between the big picture and the details. And it's to show that any visionary has to be able to master at least part of both. Because schools are the places where great visionaries with no stomach for details, they sort of come to die there. Because a school will not tolerate someone who can't really handle all the details. So vision is one thing. We also have to be very clear on what our details are and how we go about handling them correctly. First, I want to define creativity today. Then I'm going to get into what I call the uncertainty principle, which is actually a scientific term. And I'm going to make a lot of uh, allusions today to the relationship between the arts and creativity and science. You will see why, why in the past we had something called um, the, uh, the Colleges of Arts and Science. As a child, I used to wonder, what, what do those two things have in common? Why are they together in all these places? And today when I ask that question, most people don't know. They go, yeah, they're, they're both kind of creative, but how are they together? We can talk a little bit about that because that's very important. And finally, and I think Dr. Mihar has made a mention of this with all the assessments and the accountability pieces that go on in schools, what gets measured is what gets taught. And how do we make sure the arts are somehow measured without ruining them? And so that we can make sure they're being taught. People are talking about them. Years ago, we used to have a number when we were in public education called the API. And that meant our school's test scores. And you'd have it practically tattooed on your head. I'd see another principal, I think, 719, 741, 810. When I hit 800, I relaxed for about a minute. And the next year, I went down to 780, and I was all stressed out again. 
And it, I didn't do anything different in either year. Neither did the kids do anything different. It was the vagaries of testing. But 788 to 810, quite a difference in people's mentalities. We need to somehow get back to some of that so that people are paying attention to it, but at the same time, not be addicted to it. The takeaways from today. This is a very important one. We may not be ready for this full creative surge that we're talking about. We may not be ready. There's a lot of pieces that have to be put into place. Otherwise, we could have some disasters. And teaching creativity, and this is hard for some people, requires a very unorthodox methodology and slightly wacky methods. Uh, you've got to do some wild things in there that aren't traditional to schools. And some people can get uncomfortable with that. We've got to prepare the ground before we start this. And finally, as I made allusion to before, a creativity index will ensure that creativity is present. If I'm talking about the 719 and the 8, 788 and the 810 being tattooed on our foreheads, we need a similar number maybe to be tattooed on the foreheads of people with their creativity index. And I'll give you an example of that. There are many schools that were up there near 900 in these test scores. The range of the test scores was from 200 to 1,000. If you were above 900, you were considered star of stars. And I'm sure you've got some schools here that had that number. But there are some schools that that was their entire purpose. So you would go to them and there would be no activities, no creativity, no band, no school dances, nothing but detention and school and more studying and going home and getting a 900 test score. As a parent, when I'm trying to get to school for my child, I might be standing in line for the school with a 900 score saying, yeah, I really want to get in there, not knowing the full scope of it. But if they had a creativity index number next to that 900 on the same scale, they go, hey, We've got a 900 here, but we've also got a 400 on the creativity end, where this school over there with the 788 is actually looking at like an 850 when it comes to creativity. Maybe I might just want to look at that a little bit more closely. And that's the kind of thing we would need to say so that the numbers matter. We just have to make sure we're putting them in the right places. So defining creativity. The first one we think of, of course, is you make something new. It's artistic. It pops into your brain. You draw a beautiful picture. Uh, you're making up a story, and you're an incredible short story writer. You pick up an instrument and you're playing a piece of music. We think of the arts and creativity as being synonymous. I would say that they're not. Um, I hesitate to say, but I will say it, that, that creativity is kind of the overarching piece and that the arts can be a subset under that. The arts are so huge, though, it's so all-encompassing, I hate to call them a subset of anything. So we'll leave that aside. I just wanted to give you that little bit of a picture of how they might be related. But the arts and creativity are not synonymous. There's certainly one, the parts of it that don't jive. There are other type of creativity that's very interesting and it comes under a lot of discussion these days about whether or not it's um, actually creativity is the interpretation of the works of others. So if I was up here reading a book, um, being a um, literary artist, so to speak, would I really be creative by reading the work of somebody else? Would my voice inflections, the way that I interpret it, would that be a creative act on my part? I think that's an interesting question. Musicians, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later, often have that problem when they hear creativity defined. Well, I'm an interpretive musician. I'm in an orchestra. I'm in a symphony. I'm not composing. Am I creative? And that question comes up a lot. A new use of creativity, and this is extremely important in today's world, is the using the familiar in new ways. I'm going to throw out a little example of a test later about how that's used. And I'll give you an example of something that happened to me. When I was about, I want to say, 30, I went to um, downtown Los Angeles. They were giving a test for the Directors Guild of America, an exam, the hardest exam I ever took. I was there for seven hours. The part of the uh, exam that I did best on was this woman, they threw these, pep these um, popcorn questions at us like, all right, you got 30 seconds. Give me 10 uses for a belt. Yeah, the nice uses. Give me 10 uses for um, a, a clothespin. There are people there going, what's a clothespin? And so that obviously then they wouldn't be able to use a clothespin. The point, I, I think I deduced the point correctly, was that, hey, I might be on the set of a movie as an assistant director and some little problem crops up. Am I going to be creative and inventive enough to pick up that clothespin and figure out that I could close a curtain with it or something? And they wanted people who had that kind of mindset. Many people were totally stymied by that. And that showed me something right there. We now talk a lot about problem solving, creative problem solving. There could be people skills, it could be structural, it could be lots of different ways that you have to organize things when you have big, the stakes are high and people are around. That's considered a creative act now, so creative business. Now that's an example of something that might not be artistic. You've got somebody really creative in business, they understand this department needs to go there, we need to reduce the work over here, we need to move things around a little bit. It's creative but not artistic, and I'll give you a great example of that later. But creative but not artistic. And finally, the higher version of that even is looking at system configurations, whether it's information technology, whether it's the corporate America, whether it's a school reorganization, they used to call it reconstitution. All those things are creative acts because the mind is doing something new, but at the same time, they're way beyond, let's say, what we would call the arts usually. They're not part of an art discipline. But the arts can help teach this, the arts can help promote this, 
And I believe that we need these things into, as far as leaders, as far as everybody's. Can we put them into the schools effectively because of this basic structure of school, which isn't necessarily conducive to all of this? Some of the qualities of creativity. Here's one that people have a problem with. Spontaneity. I don't do any planning at all. I'm just kind of winging it. And yet I come up with this brilliant idea, but people don't buy into it because the planning wasn't done. They weren't part of the original process. But what about that, that genius who just has that spark? Do we have room for that person in the schools? Do we have room for that person in our lives? Just a question to ask. Another quality of creativity, imagining the future. What is our vision for the future? Can I look out there and see what other people don't see? Do I have something that, but I have to be able to communicate it to you. It can't be so far out of your experience that it doesn't make any sense. That would be too esoteric. So this idea about creativity is if I have a vision for the future, can I communicate it in such a way that you get excited by it? It's a little bit beyond where you are, a little bit past that curve, your comfort zone, but you go, yeah, I can get with that. And sometimes it, on my best days, that's what I do. Fluid time, difficult in schools. Fluid time means projects, performances. You might be doing something for 16 hours a day. Do you really have to wake up for seven o'clock, you know, band tomorrow, or eight o'clock biology? Well, yes, you do, maybe, or is there another way around this if we talk about the use of time? Many times, often, the artists in schools at the high school level are rebels. They break the rules a lot. They think that every, the visual artists will think that every white wall is their canvas, and we don't like that. We don't want graffiti art on the school walls. Yet, to them, it's a creative act, and they have advocates who back them on that. So how do we reconcile all this? Because we don't want to stifle the, the great creativity of the kid, but at the same time, we don't want our walls destroyed. How does all that work together? And then finally, you've got something that we don't know that we could reach necessarily in the schools, and that's the internal process of the artist. I'm a writer now, and I know what it is that goes on inside of me that I can't really communicate, and how there are certain times when I don't want to communicate because that my process is happening within me. What do you do when you've got a 16-year-old or an 18-year-old in front of you who is supposed to be responsible to you, you're, you're responsible for them, you're in local parentis, yet they're in some internal process that is not really jiving with the way the schedule is going. So these are really tough challenges, but we, we want to find a way to solve them. And then finally, the teaching of creativity. I don't know that there's anything direct that I could teach you that would make you more creative. Nothing direct. There's not a lesson. There's not um, something that we would call direct teaching. What we have is, is something a little different here. I call it creating the conditions, setting the conditions for creativity to thrive. That would be setting things up. That would be giving certain times where maybe quiet, individual time. Things that we're not used to necessarily having in schools, but that nevertheless set the conditions in the school for creativity. A big part of that is what we do with teachers. Teachers, um, again, have schedules. They have all these mandates and assessments and all the rest of this. Can we give them the place to also, one, be creative, and two, be fulfilled at work so that when the child is coming in to be creative, they're dealing with someone who is at the top of their game. They're not worried about all the, you know, the myriad things that can happen inside of a school. They are more freed up for that. And that's where the leadership comes in, is that I can free them up to be the best they can be. We'll talk about that a little later, what they can do and um, hopefully get past all this other stuff. We have the intrinsic incentive of teaching creativity. It's not that just for a pattern, this beautiful picture is not really what's gonna do it for the true artist. They need something intrinsic inside of them that you have to help develop. I have a good friend who went to Juilliard for dance, a boy. And he said that most of the work in Juilliard dance was internal, emotional, psychological, to prepare them to let their creativity flow. Because there were so many blockages prior to that. I thought that was very interesting. This is coming from Juilliard, one of our most elite institutions. And then finally, the way that you speak in a classroom, the way that you engage with students who are creative and you're trying to help be creative, the way you tell a story, the way you communicate, your word choice, all these things become part of the way that they, they can grok you, so to speak. And one of the key factors here is the use of metaphor in any aspect of the arts or any aspect of creativity, comparing one thing to another in a very unusual way so that their mind starts to scramble up a little bit. They're not going down that rut track. They're getting into that place where they start to see things a little bit differently, and they start to make that turn that allows for the new things to happen and the greatness to emerge. So I was talking before about um, what I wanted to say, somebody who was very, very creative but not artistic. And I have a real good example of that. When you think of Henry Ford and the creation of the assembly line, where did that idea come from? It's certainly not artistic. But how did he look at what was in front of him, the way people were working, and decide, if I organize it like this, and I put this over there, and I made the whole thing flow like this, the production is going to go up way through the roof. And somehow he did, though. It sparked him. 
And I thought about that because when I was a young, before I was into the arts very much, I was a young um, office manager at UCLA Medical Center. And I was managing the pre-billing department there of the hospital. And I noted that we were wasting a lot of time because all the papers came to us in um, paper clips and staples. And the clerks were tearing them apart and getting to the different places. They had to take, spend all the time tearing them apart. So I came up with this great innovation. Here's my Henry Ford moment. I was going to get rid of paper clips. I thought, well, I'll be a hero too. Not only will I do something good, I'm going to be a hero. So I said, okay, no paper clips, no staples. Everybody, we want the papers to come to us just as they are in order. People freaked out. It was like the worst thing that ever they could imagine. Well, wait a minute. Somebody's going to knock into these things. They're going to get thrown all over the place. We're never going to have any organization at all. I said, we, I think we can deal with that. So the clerks, had, some of them doing it 10 or 12 years of tearing these papers apart and slamming the stapler and doing all the rest of it, they were doing the same motions even though they had no paper clip and no staples. They were so muscularly conditioned to that that they couldn't change. But they did start to change a little bit. Finally, what happened was, the quotas that we used to have to meet were being exceeded by so much that I got called in sort of in trouble that we had to now create new quotas. So in other words, they were doing 50 of these a day, now they had to do 80, or they had to do 120 because well, you showed you could do 70 without any real rules at all, so now you're gonna do 100, 120. So of course people were upset, well we got punished for doing better, now we got to do even more better. That's kind of the way these things work in a way. The crowning moment though was when um, one morning I walked by and I happened to kick a pile of the papers and they fanned out beautifully on the ground, all perfectly, like, a, um, like you would do the 52 uh, you know, set of cards. I, I called everybody over and they didn't know what I was doing. I said, look at that. Is that wonderful or what? Because they're not out of order. They got kicked over. You have nothing to worry about. They're gonna stay in order. They're gonna fan out beautifully. And to this day, as far as I understand it, the quarters are now at about 120. And that was my hearing forward moment, so. <laughs> now the metaphor piece is, see there's a, kind of a metaphor to that. So metaphor piece is important. So scrambling your mind in new ways. And people still, when I tell the story to friends, they still remember me 20, 30 years later as that's the paperclip story. And it impresses people, not so much that I achieved something great, it's just this kind of odd thing. It makes you think, how many other things are like that? That if we just made a slight change here, a slight creative mindset, that we'd be able to do something much better. Art and creativity. Surveys say, and we've done many of these from the Arts Council, from the California Arts Council, that people will identify themselves as creative at twice the amount that they'll identify themselves as artists, as an artist. And when you think about it, it's not really surprising because to be an artist, you've got to sort of master a discipline. To be creative, you can just occasionally kind of wing it. So what we're trying to do, though, is more than that. We're trying to bring the creativity into the place where it's really as productive and we're applying it and we're using it. And then, then it becomes similar to an art. You've got things you've got to master. The person, you know, Henry Ford had to master certain things before he ever got to the point of understanding what an assembly line would do for him. I suppose I had to master something before the paperclip incident, but in some ways, we want to apply and harness the creativity, and this, so we can't just say we go to wing it, but nevertheless, some people are very scared of being artists, and when they are asked that question, they don't want to have anything to do with it. Other people think the arts are too elite and too separate from their lives, too separate from the lives of regular people. They think that. Where being creative is just that you can do on your own, and it's not really, it's not a stigma. So something to think about there. The current trends in creativity, and, and in the arts too, are that they're not standalone pieces anymore. We need the arts to be part of our social fabric. The arts are doing a lot, especially at the state level, with all of the projects that we're promoting have some kind of social value. So it could be we're restoring a river for the environment. It could be that we're doing some healing based on you know, some trauma. It could be there's an equity piece where we're bringing back cultures that make people feel more included in society. So, so that's the kind of trend in art today. I also ask the question, what is the arts of the future going to look like? And if you Google that, what you're going to get is a lot of worry about well, how the symphony is going to survive, how they're going to raise money, how they're going to do all this. That's kind of the way the direction goes when you look at it that way. But my question is going to be, because after all, I love the arts and I got into the arts for a reason, what are the new genres going to be? Is it going to be a new kind of visual art? Is there going to be some multimedia piece we don't know about? Is there a new musical genre that's out there brewing? The next hip hop, the next jazz? There probably is. We don't know it yet, but it's exciting. And I, one thing I like to do at school, especially with my teachers, is explore that and see what the kids will come up with. Hey, if you were going to go ahead and create a new genre of visual art, what would it be? And what would you call it? And present it. And then we had, now we really were getting into history and futurism, but we're getting into all these pieces that are really academic, but at the same time they're exciting and they engage people. And then push that out from there and get the community involved. Well, we're going to have a community event. We're going to call it Future. We're going to have a Futures event. And now you've got people talking about the futures of the arts. You've got the kids really showing off what they can do. Everybody's getting excited. Their learning is getting reinforced. And the whole thing is ramped up a level. 
all because of the arts. So all those pieces are there, sociology. And if you want to really get into it, mathematics, physics, we can do all that. But teaching it through something as expiring as the arts is going to go a long way. And one of the great needs in the future is going to be people who can present. The groups of four that can get up there and know how to trade off ideas. And that's the way things tend to move forward. So how can we get that into the schools? In the traditional bell period day of the 55-minute period, the bells and all that, sometimes it's a, it's a hard piece, as we'll see in a minute. Creativity in the Middle Ages, jumping back a bit. So where did all this come from? Do you know, in, um, in Latin, Spanish, French, Italian, the words to create and the words to believe are almost the same root. So creare, creare in Spanish. Very interesting. Are they related? Is it, just a, is it a trick of the letters? We don't really know. But in the Middle Ages, to create was considered the province of the divine. The human beings, the pride was considered the worst sin of all. And you were not allowed to delve into the creation that um, the maker was doing. We feel differently about that now. The Renaissance, of course, made humanism and, and the individual become more important. And certainly here in America, we, we believe in the individual having a great opportunity to create. I'm here talking about creativity. But in the Middle Ages, that was considered real heresy. You know, the topic's already established. Nobody was creating new stories then. If you look at even the Greek plays, they're all about myths that were handed down over centuries. All you were doing is interpreting myths that had a divine kind of inspiration behind them. And pride being that core sin, it would be very, very overly prideful and sinful for you to decide that you were going to create something brand new. You didn't create. If you were an artist, you practiced a craft. You replicated. But it was the Renaissance right after the Middle Ages that made that happen. You're looking, of course, at one of the seminal pieces of early Renaissance art in the, um, there in the Vatican. That's the touching of the fingers and the creation of man, so to speak. That's what you're looking at right there. Um, so that was the key moment. And we're here now at the other end of that key moment, thousands of years later, really believing in creativity, not only to be an artist, but the creativity to live. All right. At this point, if we were a little smaller group, if I was in, a, um, in kind of a workshop type situation, I'd put us through an exercise where I would say to you, I want you to give me five uses for a belt. I want you to give me five uses for a uh, clothespin. Or we'd go into some kind of activity where you'd get your mind scrambled a little bit. You'd have to really be thinking about it, and then people would read out some of the things that they came up with. So if anybody, I'll ask you again later, we'll have a second break like this. If you think about that. If you have five uses for a belt, give me a real creative one. Five uses for a clothespin. Five uses for a credit card. Five uses for your shoelace. And then we'll see if anybody, while you're thinking about it, maybe you'll come up with something brand new that I've never heard before and that'll really make your mind work. And all this is about making the minds of the people out there, the audience, work a little differently. Just make the little turn and see the paradigm a little bit differently. Okay, we're going to get you now the uncertainty principle. Does everyone know what the uncertainty principle is scientifically? People are familiar with that? You know, Einstein, getting back to some of the religious pieces I was talking about before, Einstein said, when they were talking about the uncertainty principle, he goes, God does not play dice. And that was the way he viewed this uncertainty principle that made things unsure about the way the universe was put together. So when we get down into the quantum physics level, we're looking at things that are moving. We can't really see where they are, but we have a sense of their velocity. Or if we freeze them for a moment, we see them for that quick moment, but then we don't know what their velocity is and we lose them again. That's kind of the uncertainty principle. You can't know both things at once, and it's kind of always a little bit here and a little bit there. That, that angered Einstein, because he was more the relativity guy way out there in the, in the universe, and the quantum physics people, and the, they still haven't reconciled that. They still have not reconciled quantum physics and the general theory of relativity. So we'll I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So here's the uncertainty principle for a ninth grader in high school. This is one of my favorite quotes ever. I use it all the time. My friend Jack R., I know him now as an adult, grade nine. He says, I feel like a pinball in a broken machine. The flippers just randomly smack me around. I end up in third period geometry or fifth period geography, and I'm relieved when they call my name and I'm in the place they expect me to be. The word random is a really interesting word. Um, with a creative uh, assignment I once gave kids, I wanted them to name the age. I said, this is the age. You know, we have the Iron Age, we have the Bronze Age, we have the Hippie Age. We got all these names we put on things that are representative. What's the age now? The one that stuck the most was they called it the random age. And you know as kids use that word a lot, still do? The random age, meaning no rhyme, no reason, no through line, no cause and effect, just the random age. And I, it stuck with me because there's a lot of, I understand, that really explains the world pretty well right now. Things happen. You see them on the news. We've got this going on, we've got that going on. They're, they don't seem related. They just seem like they're popping up all over the place. And what it tells me emotionally, it's really hard. 
The random age is not an easy thing to live through because you don't have a through line that gives you what's going to happen next and that your action is going to make a difference and it's just going to happen any way it happens. Now, I don't know if it's true, but it is the perception that the random age is what we're going through right now. So Jack and the pinball machine, he's just like, the flipper's broken machine, flippers are randomly batting me around, and I show up at third period geography. Students of the school experience. Now, here's a, here's a group of um, young Latino artists just, um, just up here in the United States. And Elena, who's translating for them, is translating the question that these auditors have for them. And she's saying to them, are we learning anything from this work? Um, is what she's asking. The auditor is asking them, her to translate for them. So they have a little conversation, and Elena comes back with a little bit of confusion. She's telling the auditors, they aren't sure how to answer the question. No one asked them before, but they want to know, can you learn art? Because they never thought it was something you could teach. It was either you had a natural ability or you didn't. Even more important to me out of that statement was that no one ever asked them before. And something we need to constantly be asking students is, are you learning from this? Is this meaningful to you? What is it that could be different and what would help you learn? So that's important here. It just seemed like a, a big disconnect, especially if you had to go through two languages to do it. And teacher on the creativity in the schools. So here's a teacher who's um, new to the school district that I'm talking about here. And she says, our contract encourages us to bring our whole creative selves to work. So in other words, when she signs the contract, there's a clause in there that says, we really want you to be here. We're recruiting you, bringing your creative self to work. I'm not sure they really want that, she said. Burn, she was a burner. Burning man may not be compatible with school culture. Just think about that for a minute. Well, it's not. Secondly, and also, it happens the first week of school, basically. So a lot of the burner people that are teachers, they got to miss that first week of school if they're going to get there. If we open the door to true creativity, we'd better be prepared for what is coming in the door. And that is something, you know, that can be a challenge. When you have a playwriting class, what is the subject of the play is going to be? We're asking these kids to be creative. They have deep experiences. Are we ready for a 60-year-old to really pour their soul out to us in such a way that it's going to be on stage with people acting it out? That can be a jarring experience. And there are many people who think no place in schools. So here we go with some of the disconnects I was talking about. We want the creativity. We think the play is brilliant. Maybe it was happening outside of school. We think the kid was a genius. But in the school setting, it doesn't always sit right. Burning Man. I think it's a great example of the, the extreme, maybe upper end of where a school could handle parts of Burning Man as part of its culture. If the teacher brought in an example, the right kind of example, maybe we could get to that edge. But beyond that, into the real the core of what Burning Man is, just no place in schools. So we have to understand that creativity might start opening some of these doors, and how are we going to handle the stuff that comes in that we may have? The first reaction is to censor it. And once you open up the door, and then you start censoring things, you have a whole new set of problems. So people say you better should have avoided it in the first place. Now we get into a combination of all these things I'm talking about. So one school district in particular that I was working with had a framework for the future. It was Future Framework 2027, so five years from now. They had radical vision. They had pledges within their radical vision. They were calling it the radical vision pledge number seven. We will extend the concept of space and time to accommodate student learning needs. The traditional school day in the traditional spaces is a relic of the past. The world is not standing still. While we grapple with outdated procedures and limitations designed for a different era. Okay. Look what I put in red. Oh, good. I'm glad you like that. I'm glad you like that because my next video is going to show you how it gets way later. Maybe we can fight some of those uh, barriers. What I put in red there should click back to what I was talking about before. I was talking about Einstein and just science in general. Space and time. Well, space-time is an Einstein creation. The world is not standing still. Who's, does that remind you of any scientist? Galileo, right? And still it moves. He doesn't stand still when he decided that the Earth was revolving around the sun. So we've got some very, very old ideas here that we're supposedly trying to surmount. Sure enough. School's challenge of the ages. Can we handle space-time and new space-time? And the Earth moves? You're sure now. It's not the sun. The sun is the center, not the Earth. You're sure of this now. Heresy, right? And as he's He's being taken out in shackles, and still it moves, he said. So he's kind of defiant. So we have to be a little bit defiant to get some of this done. So a vignette, okay, a story, an overview. So I'm going to try to get this one right. This is some of the papers I brought out. This is a true story. That's a complicated story. So we have school A, and it's a fairly progressive school, and it's very into the arts. And they are, um, they're putting on a musical. And as they get closer and closer to the opening to the musical, it's really frazzling out the whole school. Musicals are huge productions. And when you have the whole school involved, let's just say it's a cast of 50 or 60. 
the kids are missing class because they're out in rehearsal, uh, during tech week particularly. So technical week leading up to the opening night can be a massively, you go to midnight every night. Do the kids then go to their class at 8 o'clock in the morning? They, we have to think about student health, right? We want them in this musical. And they're in an art school, so they, they expect to be in a musical. Their parents expect them to be in a musical. What happens to the first period social studies? What happens to third period biology? Are they just all falling by the wayside? You've also got a very proud academic staff who's doing phenomenal work. These kids want to get into great colleges. You've got all these pressures around, there's only 24 hours in a day, and some of that is supposed to include sleep. So the day of the um, actual uh, preview, not opening night yet, but preview, which is going to be very, very big, and generally you try to make the preview a straight run through of the show. You want it to be as perfect as it can be because opening night's the next night, so you want to give them that opportunity to flex their muscles a little bit. Preview day, um, the kids have been in tech rehearsal the night before until about midnight. And the a certain teacher made a deal with some of the kids that if you can't make it to my second period class tomorrow morning, I need you to text me. Uh, we, you know, we're, um, I'm going to put in the absences as excused, and it'll be fine. Everything's fine. So some glitch happened there where the kids got to the teacher, but the teacher got really busy and then left at 3 o'clock or 3.30 when they were supposed to, and the, the uh, actual excused part of it never got into the system. So people start reading the system that is now dropping these kids because it's not an excused absence. It factors into their grade. There's all the kind of school details. Remember I was talking about detail versus vision? Here's, here's the detail part, so I hope I don't bore you with it. The kids are getting zeros because this was not an excused absence. And as people were looking at this in the system that the school had, the technological system, their grades were dropping below the mark in some cases that they were allowed, you fall below a certain amount, you can't perform. It's like academics, it's supposed to be at least a 2.0. All of a sudden there's this panic. The principal's gone that day because I'm um, doing something else. He was going to supervise opening night. The assistant principal was going to supervise the, the preview night. Well, as it worked out, you've got all these angry teachers. You've got parents rushing in now because their kids are now being pulled from the stage. So this is the idea like two to three hours before actual preview night. Well, they can't perform. They can't perform. Everybody's up in arms. Can you imagine? Just freeze the moment there. You're at an hour before curtain. You've got all this tension, all this stress. Everybody's running around trying to figure out what to do. And you've got in the middle of it this assistant principal who says, we have to be staunch. We, we promised the faculty that we were going to honor their grades. And this is important. These kids can't perform, including one of the leads. Does anybody have what they want here? I mean, just freezing the moment for a minute before we get there. Is there anything good that's going to come of this, short of changing the whole thing? Or I, is there any, are you teaching the kid a lesson? I doubt it. Um, are you helping any kind of future movement towards better grades? Things are going to fall apart. The, the social studies teacher couldn't be contacted. Maybe he would have at some point verified that, oh my God, I forgot to put the grades in. Whatever, here we are right at that moment. Finally, the principal does show up. Stopped back at the school for some reason, saw the chaos, and actually had a solution that was already a solution, but people hadn't figured it. The grades were not able to be dropped on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. There was a deadline, a cutoff at which those grades counted, so that we didn't have to go through something like this. Because it was a new policy, and because people didn't really like it, because they felt like, oh, this kid's doing fight up until two weeks ago, and now he can just mess up and get these zeros, and they're still going to get to perform. Because they didn't like it, and because it was new, it was allowed to create all this confusion and people you know, demanding this and demanding that. Luckily, calmed everybody down and got the show on the road. But had he not shown up, I truly don't know what would have happened. I truly don't know what would have happened. I understand the tensions there. And we want to honor the academic teachers, and we don't want the kids to mess up and get zeros, but we've got to have more flexibility in the system, is I think what I'm trying to tell you. More flexibility in the system, because that's what was lacking here. It's what I would call a systems failure. There were some individuals who could have done things a little better, but truly it was beyond the scope of any one person. Luckily, a school principal happens to be a place where all this leadership is centered, and he was able to say, it's like this, and people accepted it grudgingly, but it was a lesson. Now... You can see all the characters listed there. Everybody's involved, including an attendance clerk. You've got quite a cast of characters. You could, if you're a good writer, you can make a play out of this. You really could. Um, for, for parents and an advocate, really interesting, because a lot of times, you know, parents who are angry um, will come with someone who's going to, you know, plead their case. So they bring advocates in, because the school doors are wide open, and lots of people can come in and um, be part of the school experience. You know how we all, often talk about, um, well, you know, it's not brain surgery, or how come they give me so much advice? They wouldn't give advice to their brain surgeon. Well, yeah, I wouldn't give advice to my brain surgeon, that's for sure. But what about giving advice to uh, school administrators or teachers? Why do people feel that that's okay to do? Which it is, I agree that it is. And the reason I think they do is because we've all been through that. Everybody sitting in here, everybody that I've ever met, has been to school in one capacity or another. So we all kind of are experts. We've been the client, the consumer. If you're the parent, we certainly are going to listen to you if you come in and start talking about your child. So everybody's got to say what goes on in schools. That could be great, that could be difficult. In this case, it was, became a little difficult. 
So the moment of truth, we got on stage that night. Does anyone, take a guess at what musical that is. Does anyone have any idea? Yep, School of Rock. That's good. This is, this is another part of the great story. That is School of Rock. We at Oakland School for the Arts were given the great opportunity to do the West Coast premiere of School of Rock written by Andrew Lloyd Webber. That was phenomenal. He had opened it on Broadway and decided on the West Coast he wanted a school to do it. So I got a call from an artistic director in San Francisco who said, you know, do you think your school might be able to do this? And as she was talking, I started going through my calendar going, yeah, we can do this. So we blocked out 12 weeks in the school year to get it done. And can you imagine had that grade controversy stopped Andrew Lloyd Webber's School of Rock from getting onto the stage? Come on. It was, it was marvelous. That's, that's the teacher in the middle there, jumping up and down. He's a middle, uh, high school student. The middle school kids played the students. The high school kids played the adults. And this was that crazy Jack Black character who, phenomenal. I'm glad somebody knew it was School of Rock. The girl right there that's leaning forward with the little bow tie on, she was the bass player at which Andrew Lloyd Webber insisted that the girl had to play the bass. And in fact, all the student musicians couldn't just pantomime it up there. They had to really, really play. So this girl comes to the audition. She's got a beautiful singing voice, good actress, she played the bass gets the role. Find out a month later, she didn't know how to play the bass. She learned just enough riffs and just enough whatever it took to get that role for that, on that particular audition. <laughs> By the time she got on the stage, she was so, I don't even remember her name compared to the character's name. Is she either Susie and and Andrea or Andrea and Susie? She was that much into it. I really admired her for that. At one point I said to her, I said, did you really just learn the bass for this role? She goes, yeah, I did. And thank you very much. It's like, um, she's like gushing. It's the best experience of my life. And she was, she was totally wonderful. I will never forget her. A girl whose hid, face is hidden by that elbow there, Jack Black's elbow, um, was in my office one day talking to a reporter on the phone. She's an eighth grader. Her parents gave me permission to let her talk to the reporter. And apparently the reporter asked her, um, did you like watch the movie or did you, what's your experience? How did you prepare for this role? She goes, oh no, I didn't watch anything at all. I didn't want to copy anything. I wanted you to get this role. It had to come deep inside of me. I had to really find it. She's 13. I'm, I'm in heaven. I'm saying, this is it. You know, this is why I'm here. Um, it was really something special. I, I really, I wanted to look deep inside of myself and find this role. Because she's playing a mean, sassy, bossy. She was the adult in the room while Jack Black was being a kid. Um, but she wanted to find it deep inside herself. So these are the kind of, when, when you let creativity flow, you know, she was out late. Maybe she didn't go to second period social studies. But, but she did that. And that's pretty special, I think. So what do we have here? Summing that, this vignette up. Resolution and debrief and the values clash. So on the one point, on the one hand, we've got the, Gal the pre-Galileo universe, the static universe. On the other hand, we've got the heliocentric or the sun-centered um, space-time world of Einstein. So from planning, we go to spontaneity. Can we deal with that? Because spontaneity means I wake up in the morning and I can't get to second period. I'm going to just call right now or text. We have defined rules. We have uncertainty. We have fixed time. We have fluid time. We have one of the great tenets of teaching, and even me as a principal was always into this, are you bell-to-bell -bell teaching? You've got 55 minutes. If I walk in at minute two, and I walk in at minute 54, am I going to see teaching the whole time? That used to be the rule. Now we're looking at, well, the kid's kind of tired. And the whole theater class, really, they did the theater work last night on stage, so I guess, are they going to be able to listen to music or do some other homework? Or are we not doing bell-to-bell -bell teaching anymore? That's a sacred cow. So we've got to think about that. We have grades and deadlines. Then we've got progress and pacing. So that, you know, you didn't get this in on this date, that grade, well, we're not really working that way anymore. We're working more about progress, and we have different pacing that we're going to try to organize. Easy for some people, not for others. Control and liability versus independence and trust. Hard one, right? We're trained not to let anything dangerous happen. We're trained to be in control at all times as school leaders. What about a situation like this? Pretty uncontrollable when you've got 75 kids running around trying to put out a play, and they're coming into school at different times the next day. Difficult. Again, not insurmountable, but it has to be handled, has to be handled right, and has to be worked with. You've got to use some creativity to make creativity work. The classes in silos. My social studies class is the only class in the universe. I don't care how much other homework they're giving you or what other things you're doing. My class is my class. Larger universal context. I sit in the middle of a universe where my particular needs or my normal demands are now going to be adjusted because it's good for the, good for the whole child and good for the whole community. So that's a different way of looking at the world. So again, the static universe versus the heliocentric universe. What gets measured, which we talked about before. So what gets measured is what gets taught. As I told you about the, you know, the stamping of the um, API in the forehead, we knew what everybody's schools were doing. We knew how much hard work they had to do to get up to the level we expected them to get to. Um, and you know, the papers in those days when we had that API score, which I think was gone about five or six years ago, 
Um, it used to really be a shaming operation sometimes. Where there'd, be there'd be worst of lists, which about the newspaper. So I'm reading the San Francisco Chronicle, and there's my friend's schools that have got this, you know, there were 10 worse this, or eight worse that, which is not good. But the scores lend themselves to that. So what gets taught gets, um, what gets uh, measured gets taught, and we want to make sure that they're measuring the right things so that the right things are getting taught. So this is bringing, all the things I've mentioned up to this point are bringing big changes into schools. And we have to ease them along somewhat slowly, but sometimes you can't. Working with many different faculties throughout my career, this is a non-scientific, but a personal, and I think very accurate depiction of what happens when you're facing a big group of people and you try to create change. 7% of the people that you work with are going to run really fast to get something done. They love it. They look great at first. They go, oh, they're really, they're, they're my man. I'm going to follow them and it's all going to go well. But they race too fast ahead. They don't bring anybody with them. And finally, when, it, when they have trouble, they just collapse and they're tired and that's it. It's over. They didn't bring anybody along with them. And that took me a long time to learn that. You know, the young assistant principal, and you'll, many will tell you this, I'm going to do it all myself. It's better if I do it. I'm going to get it all done. I'm going to be great. And it's going to be great for the school. But it turns out that it's not because this is a communal effort. Your next group is who you really need to work with. You're 15% of the early adopters. They get what you're saying. They really back you up fully. They're with you totally. And they bring other people with them. And they work together and they collaborate. And they move forward in a progressive kind of way that works. Maybe even occasionally they'll pick up some of the 7% who are still riding on the ground, exhausted. And you get a little bit more there. This next group is super, super important. These are the 26% that are your solid professionals. They get on board, they waited for the early adopters to do their thing, they scoped it out, they looked ahead, they looked backwards, they said, yeah, we think this just might actually work. And then when you get them on board, now you're rolling. But if you add up those first three percentages, you're looking at about 48%. You're still not at 50. So you've got to get over that hump. Like 50 to 60 is where you need to be at least to get rolling. So you're not all the way there yet. And that's where you delve into where things start to get a little more difficult. 24% of the people are skeptics. They doubt most things they hear. They've heard they've sold a lot of you know, goods down the road, so they want to be sure what they're looking at is real. And they're going to wait, and sometimes they're going to back off, and sometimes they're going to start talking about what you're doing in a negative way, and you may see the thing begin to slide backwards. So here's where the skill of the leader comes in, is how do you massage these next two groups, the skeptics, and then finally, your toughest group, the contrarians. 20%, one out of every five, they're there every day, they do the work, they're good teachers, they're in the classroom, but they don't like administration, and they don't want any of these changes, and they don't trust any of them, they've heard it before, it didn't work, it's not going to work now, who's this new guy with this new stuff, this seemingly new stuff? Tough to beat these guys, but sometimes you have to engage your 24% of the skeptics there who they trust, more than they trust you, and you have to let your teachers be leaders and let them lead this group. Once you've started to make inroads there, now you're rolling, and you can handle with the refuse nicks that are coming next. These are the people that are in principle against everything, just everything. I've gone to schools to review them, and you have people who take the school motto and turn it upside down and make drawings on it. You've got all sorts of folks that just want nothing to do. They want to be silent in their classroom. I'm an individual. I've got academic freedom. I'm going to do a great job. Don't bother me. And then 2% not aware that anything different is happening at all. <laughs> Everybody knows that from your own work, right? You're just rolling right along. What? What was that all about? And they can be great, too. You know, it's just in the, in the scope of trying to make change, these folks, hopefully, no more than 2%. That could be a little problem with more than 2%. You don't want anybody who's going to drag things down. But absolutely, people just go, yeah, what was that all about? I think I heard vaguely about that, even though they're three doors down from you. So, oh, you know, you know what? I got the initial idea to do this, this unscientific study. Somebody once, when I was in graduate school, um, gave us a game, a board game, that was actually called School District. And... This is where the, that 7% idea is the first one I got out of that. So here I am with my school district game, and you got these little men, and you got the rolling dice, and you got cards, and you know, it looks like Monopoly. And uh, so I'm racing ahead with my project, right? I'm on project number one, and there's good old me with my 7 and my 12, and I'm just racing around the board. I hit, on like my 6th or 7th move, I hit something that said, um, you did not stop it at HR for the third time. Go back to the beginning. <laughs> Way back, that, back to zero. I never found that game again. I don't know, maybe the, maybe the instructor made it up, but um, I think it exists somewhere. But I was really, I, that really was telling to me. And later in my career, when I actually succeeded at something, I, um, I turned to my secretary who was with me. I go, we went back for the third time. She goes, what are you talking about? I said, remember that school district game I was telling you about? This time we got it done because it was our third visit to the contract person. So, that, so really, years later, resonated for me that that was a good thing to do, was to go back a third time, even though I wish it didn't have to be that way. So, Creativity. People call it the cherry on the cake. I think Dr. Meharis before made reference to, you know, the arts are getting pushed away. We've got all these requirements, and, and suddenly they're not around anymore because we, we had to get this done and that done. But really, when we look at the future of our kids and the future of, I think, what, what arts education should be and, and education in general, 
Creativity is not the cherry atop the cake. It's the cake itself. Now think about this for a minute. What visionary could look at wheat stalks, a chicken's leftover eggs that didn't amount to anything, um, sugar cane, a handful of hard dark beans, like cocoa beans, and say, oh yeah, 350 degrees for about 45 minutes, I'll give you a chocolate cake. <laughs> Nobody's got, I, it's impossible to figure that out, but somehow it did happen. Where was that initial idea? If we trace it all the way back, where did that spark come from? There's a spontaneity part. Where did that spark come from that gave us, that gave us a chocolate cake? Where, did it happen naturally? And said, oh, we'll just replicate what happened naturally? I don't know. But that's the kind of thing in our schools, when I said setting the conditions, that we want to do. We want that chocolate cake to emerge from our schools. What is the next chocolate cake going to be? I don't know, a new clothing line? A new, a new genre in playwriting? I don't know. How do you stimulate kids to be creative? So let's just say you go through your regular school day and you have a class, your ninth grade class is called creativity. There's usually an extra ninth grade class because we don't normally teach history in the ninth grade. So there's an open period. A lot of schools do different things with it. Health, the other requirements. Let's say you made that class creativity. What would it be like? How do you, how do you inspire the creative in a kid? They've already got four you know, solid academics, maybe PE is another period. And now you've got this creativity class. The way I used to approach this, and I would do this in the summer sometimes, when we could experiment a little bit. We have these summer school classes. Explain to me, you're, you're one of my 20 kids in my class, what I mean when I say, you can't get there from here. And, and that, to us, that's fairly a familiar saying. You know, it's kind of, it's like saying, you're not really impossible, but anyway, we know how to use that phrase. A lot of kids don't, and they really have to think about that. You can't get there from here. They're used to Google Maps. They're looking at things where you can get anywhere from anywhere. And we know you can't get anywhere from anywhere. But what does it mean when we say that? Or how about dividing by zero? I had some kids, some math phobic kids, who said, you, wait a minute, I gotta figure that out. And they wouldn't believe that you couldn't divide by zero. Because the premise of that is, you're giving something, somebody something impossible, right? If you say divide by zero. But the discussions that come from this kind of phraseology is what I'm talking about, stimulating creativity. And having a class like that, that I did in one ninth grade year, where every ninth grader took it, changed the face of the school. I heard different kind of conversations in the hallway. I heard different kind of conversations in classrooms all around this very creative teacher who had ideas like this, that she was scrambling up the brains of the kids in a good way, making them jarred a little bit out of their comfort zone and having to deal with stuff like that, which I found fascinating. I use, the dividing by zero is a great metaphor. It's a metaphor for you can't do it, you try something impossible. It's like dividing by zero. And here's a saying I've always loved, and I used to have kids try to make up their own version of it. So Abraham Maslow, everybody knows Maslow's hierarchy, right? You go from being, needing to have your, your social needs met, I mean, sorry, your physical needs met, then your social needs, then love, and then on top of it, yourself actualized. So Abraham Maslow, a brilliant psychologist. He has something called the theory of the instrument. If your only tool is a hammer, it's easy and tempting to treat everything like a nail. And the first time I heard that, it's like scrambled my brain a little bit. I said, well, what does that mean exactly? It's not the usual way we talk about things. We're sort of going at it in reverse. So you could, you know, if we, again, if we were in that sort of smaller setting and we were gonna do that kind of exercise, um, we would, I would say, make up two or three of your own. If, okay, if my only tool was, a, was an orange, it makes everything look like a, no, I can't make anything out of that. I mean, that's sort of stuff where you get the kids thinking and then occasionally a kid would come up with something just brilliant. Now, before I told you to be thinking about like six uses for a clothespin or 10 uses for a belt, does anyone have one they'd like to share at this moment? Anybody have a really interesting use of a belt or a, a clothespin or a credit card? Or the fourth thing I mentioned, whatever it was. Okay. Maybe you do inside your head. The point is, are you getting your brain worked? Is this a brain exercise that's going to allow you, when you walk out of here, to see the world a little bit differently and to have permission to see it differently? To have permission to fail or say something crazy? When you're brainstorming, everything's supposed to count, right? Yeah. But when I talked about wacky methods early on, these are the kind of wacky methods that work in a creativity class and I think change the school. So there was our exercise. There, oh, there is a test for creative thinking, by the way. It's called the Torrance test of creativity or creative thinking. And that's where the idea of the six uses of the belt and the six uses of the um, clothespin come from. Getting people out of their comfort zone to use objects in brand new ways, the familiar things around them, seeing what they can come up with, and you really see a wide difference. The, the bell curve and the scale on that is really wide. And it's people who are really, really good at it and people who don't even understand the question. Now we have storytelling and picture completion as another piece of the Torrance test to, to get at. And I'm bringing this up because when I talk in a few minutes about the cre creativity index that I'm interested in, these are the kind of tests that we would give to see if the school is being creative. 
these are examples of circles that were given to kids. It's just make a story out of these three circles that are in a row. Go right ahead, make a story, and we're going to grade it for its creativity. You can see at the top, we've got a sun. These are the French, by the way. I don't know if you can read the actual writing. The kids, soleil, and we've got orlage for the clock, and we've got un visage for the face. And that was considered just a level one of creativity. By the time we get down to level uh, four here, you've got the circle becomes two, the tails of two cats who are holding hands and making, and sort of they're in love. You've got um, some kind of electrical outlet that's being plugged in one side to the other, and then you've got the shape of a banana and the mouth of a kid that's about to be eaten. It's that same circle that up there was just a, a simple sun. So that's a high score for creativity. I would have never gotten any of these at all. I first had to look at them to even understand what they were. So that kid, super creative kid. And there's like third graders, I think, were doing this. And the way that we grade, the way that we grade the imagination, if we really want to put numbers on it, and I talked before about do we, do we ruin things when, when they're creative and, and abstract? Do we ruin them by putting numbers on them and making them look like everything else? Um, I hope we don't, because we do need something like this to score it and let people know what's happening and push ourselves harder because we need to measure it. We look at the fluency of the story. We look at its originality. We look at, this is a really good one, we look at its resistance to premature closure. So if certainly for kids and us as adults, I think do a lot of this too. We just want to wrap it up. Give, I'll get the answer out of there. I'm done. But if you really can hold yourself back and let some of the pieces you know, fly through your brain the way they should, you're going to come up with better solutions, more creative solutions. Abstract ideas, meaning we're, we're very concrete in schools. We're very factual. We teach a lot of facts. Can we get kids into bigger ideas, justice, inequity? These are the things that in a story, do we see the pieces of these abstract ideas showing up as creative? And finally, elaboration. Going back down now to the details. How many details do you include in the story? And which ones do you choose? If you chose every detail, you'd never be able to tell a story. It would just all be a list of details. So if, you, if we need detail to understand certain things and make them happen, what details do we choose? And that, you know, being a writer now, that to me is a very important question. Is this detail telling that it's going to make the thing bigger later? Or somehow is it telling that it represents more than just itself? Or is it just a detail? And the truth is that the better writers, the better, better artists, you see it in movies as well, they pick just the right detail that evokes something. So some creative assignments I've given that really bring out creativity in kids. People here familiar with the Salton Sea? Closer to you than it is to me? The Salton Sea is a phenomenal scientific artistic project that you could do so much with. You could, you could create a whole year out of this. So briefly, the Salton Sea is an inland sea that was unnaturally formed by the breaking of the uh, dam on the Colorado River, and it snuck into the area the south of um, Indio, south of Palm Springs area, and now it's a big, op years ago when it first happened, it's a big open freshwater sea, basically, and um, it was really it was phenomenal. They made a resort out of it. It was this big new thing, all the Hollywood people going there. It was this incredible thing for about 10 years. But because it was unnatural, it wasn't meant to last. And then the Army Corps of Engineers got involved, and they created dams and there were, or the outlets and inlets, and they were doing all this un more unnatural stuff to it. Finally, it silted up, became unusable, and now it's just a wasteland. And if you go there, you look at some of these colors. Here's a lagoon. You can see how toxic those things are. So that lagoon up there in red, we don't know, sulfur? That's not, no, not, not a good place to swim. This is actually a beach. There's a waves coming in, actually. And the, the yellow is from all the dead fish. That's the, the bodies and the carcasses of all the dead fish. Fish are died by the tens of thousands there, and still are. So, you know, there's so much there. There's the greed of the developers. There's the sociology of, um, of people wanting a good resort. There's the desert and the, the, you know, the scientific end of it, the desert and the sand and the flora. There's so much there, and of course, visually look at it. I mean, the photography, a lot of people have done a lot of photography there. Soci sociologically, you've got the people that are still there. Who, who's left behind in the Salton Sea? So I found this to be a phenomenal project that brings out creativity, and kids have done wonderful stuff with this because they, they get it, they understand it, it's colorful, it's exciting, and it's super meaningful. The best assignment I ever gave. <clears throat> I was a young substitute teacher, and I always had this idea, so I was just going to go ahead and do it. I was a long-term sub. I told these fourth graders, all right, every afternoon, as long as you do your work in the morning, we're going to create a board game. Each of you in groups of three or four, create your own board game. You've got to have rules, cards, whatever you need. All the materials are here, and you go ahead and do it. These are really unruly fourth graders. The discipline they showed, the work they came up with, was just phenomenal. It got to the point where in the morning, I would find kids sneaking into their desks and pulling their board game out and trying to add another little feature to it. And, you know, I'm kind of doing your math now, Johnny, but uh, pretty, pretty um, gripping to see the kind of work they did. And when you think about the skills that would go into that, the rules, the sequencing, the numbers, the, the shape of things, the aesthetics, the decision making, all that, and then having to sell it, we'd make them sell it to us afterwards as if we were doing a pitch. 
all the public speaking, all the, you know, how they're trading off talking when they're pitching it. Probably the best assignment I ever gave, and I've done it a few more times since then, but that fourth grade class was really my groundbreaker on that. I said that was phenomenal. And, you know, I know it's fun, and sometimes you worry about that. There was all this fun, not learning anything. There was more learning going on in that assignment, I'm telling you, than anything I've probably seen. So now, now my main point. So what gets measured gets taught. So here's the measurement. So my, um, my hope was, and this has been talked about a little bit, three states have tried to approach something like this for the schools. California's one of them. Um, Oklahoma and Massachusetts, both of whom have a strong um, history of creativity. But Boston Public Schools are a good place to look for a lot of innovation. And um, unfortunately, nobody ever got this past the committee point. It's never really gotten off the ground. But I do think there's a, there's a pilot here that's worth looking at. If we went into a school as a team to review it, and we came out of there with a creativity score, what would we be looking at is the point of this part of it. We'd be looking at classroom activity. I mean, how many questions are open-ended where there's not just one right answer? Um, what kind of student projects are going on in the classroom, and do they have any choice in them? These are the kind of things we can ask at the elementary level. And you can see I ramp it up into middle school. And finally, in high school, what kind of courses are being offered? Are you offering courses that we could say are creative? And we're expanding the definition of creativity to include leadership, government, things that are where the kids have to use their own capacities other than just learn particular facts. The creativity testing, I showed you an example of the Torrance um, creative test before. I don't know that I would creative, give a kid, every kid in a given school um, a creativity test, but I would like to see the results of, you know, what can they do with something like that? What can they show us about their own creativity in a testing environment? Because we're used to a testing environment. This is a way to sell it to other educators. We're doing the same kind of thing, just with different content. Um, yeah, the curriculum choice and course offerings I mentioned slightly before, I think that should really be its own thing, particularly in high school, where is there a course in creativity? Is there a course in the arts? Is there a course, even for kids who are non-artists, is there a course in music appreciation, which we used to have? I thought those were great courses. And, you know, we worry about vocabulary a lot because um, a lot of the studies have shown that one of the number one deciders on who does well in college is how good your vocabulary is. The arts have a vocabulary to kill for. It's got the most detailed, nuanced stuff that just it, it affects everything. And finally, a professional development of the staff. I mean, what are their degrees in? What kind of training do they have? Are they getting trained in creativity? So through these four domains, I call them, you put together a package of a creative measure of a school in a, in a format that doesn't look all that different from what we've done before. It's a little slightly different. It's just an expensive model. You've got to have these people walking around from, let's say, a district level or a county level making these kind of you know, assessments. But there's value here if we value creativity. We put a lot of money behind standardized testing. I have my own feelings about that. I was always proud of my 812, but it was tattooed on my forehead, so I'm not going to be disingenuous and say they don't matter, because they do. But I think this is something else, too. This does matter. I was always worried about the school with a 900 score and a 200 creativity rating. That school scared me a little bit, because it was way too much for the result. So this, this, this is the big pitch, all right? When, when this is talked about in the future, and it may come up again, this is, this is the kind of thing they're talking about, is you find a way... Put it on the same scale, by the way, with what the score looks like for the academics. So if you've got a 738 and a 300, you understand the difference between the two. So finally, the creativity conference, another vignette. So for a while, in about 2015 or so, when I was first on the California Arts Council, I was um, part of a group called Create California. And what we did in Create California was put together a blueprint for the school superintendent at that time, uh, Tom Torlakson. We put together a blueprint for him on what a creative school, a creative school system, a creative school, state school system would look like. And we had all these experts, mostly 200 of us working on this. People in media, people in theater, dance, how to fit it all together, how to make it work. So the last, uh, one of the conferences was down on Coronado Island. And the last conference of that week, I think it was on a Friday afternoon, was called something really basic like Creativity 101. You know, half the people were gone already. That's the way it happens. You feel you did something wrong if you get the last, on a Friday at a conference, you get the last um, slot, you feel you did something wrong. This is a pretty good class, though, Creativity 101. Um, and the teachers were really fun, and they started asking us questions about creativity. There's about 20 of us in there. And started defining what creativity was. What does it look like? And the way they were defining it was kind of new, and we hadn't really heard that before. I mean, 2015 isn't that long ago, but it was kind of cutting edge. On the way out, so I'm, I'm standing talking with some um, scientists who were there for the conference on, on the way out. And they were saying, wow, we really were energized by that. We really are creative. Look at all the things that we do that fit that definition. We try stuff. We make, we make it happen or we don't make it happen. We adjust. We, all the things we talked about, studio habits of mind coming out of Harvard, we do. They were really excited. Coming by us walks two morose-looking kind of unhappy guys. Well, yeah, we don't feel real creative at all. You know, we're high school uh, classical music teachers, and we, we teach the orchestra, and we don't like mistakes. We don't learn from mistakes. We try to get rid of them. We just, like, try to hide them. 
And they were really morose about the whole thing, that they didn't feel that that creativity defined them. And that was what I alluded to earlier about the interpretation of other people's works. You know, the fact is I do think they're creative, and I finally looked into it a little bit more and realized there was a lot of creativity in making choices even with an interpretation. But at the moment, I thought it was very interesting that I had more in common with the swashbuckling, the swashbuckling science teachers that I did with the kind of morose classical music teachers. I was supposed to be in the arts. And here I was with a whole different group that was actually shining. And that opened my mind a lot to the future and to what, what the kind of things I'm talking about today. It was really kind of um, eye-opening and revealing. So just a little vignette about the conference. From, uh, I always want to get back to that, realize when we think we know something, we don't always know it. It's just, it comes out to be something different. And that's a good thing to keep your mind open to. So for all of this, so 31 years of public education, a um, lot of different roles. I was, my first teaching job was at juvenile hall. I taught the kids that were incarcerated because I'd just come back from Asia and it was mid-year. I didn't have a job. I walked into San Francisco Unified. I said, what do you got? They took a look at me. I was still wearing my hiking clothes and all that. They go, juvenile hall for you. And um, I stayed two years there in different capacities. So learned a lot from that, moved through the ranks, was able to get my creative side going and eventually became the director of art schools. But I've seen a lot in public education. So what have I learned in 31 years? Maybe number one lesson, meet the students where they are and the arts do that really, really well. They'll move pretty fast if you join them in the early part of their journey. And the one thing the arts can do in, in using the arts in different subject areas, I haven't talked anything about um, um, arts integration, which is a big subject around using the arts to teach social studies, draw maps, and do the things that you can do artistically in any subject. They give every student an entry point. If I want to tell a story for an English class, I can start at the level I'm at, the guy across the hall or whatever can start at the level he or she is at, and we have a place, an entry way for students to get into the curriculum, because that's what we want is that kind of entry point. So meet the students where they are. Number two. And this one is not usually talked about. Teachers are one of the most underutilized resources in America. Absolutely, they have talents and skills and degrees and things they love. Many of them are artistic. Most teachers have some kind of arts background. We need to be able to use what they have more in the schools than giving them five remedial classes of this or, or that packed schedule that, that Superintendent Biharis was talking about. We need to unpack that schedule a little bit and give them some room. In the school where I had the most resources, what I used to do is I'd give the teachers their four solids. Their fifth class was something, if they could get 15 kids to sign up for it, they could teach it. So I'd have their four, they'd be teaching four English classes, four social studies classes. And the fifth course was, it could be ethnic studies, it could be women's studies, it could be anything we wanted, as long as they got the kids interested and got them to sign up for it, and they loved it. They had to be passionate about it. Imagine that your teacher's school day, 20% of it is their choice, and they are able to be passionate about something they love and teach it. Another piece that changed the schools. Now, that's a very resource-heavy thing that I was just describing, because every class you're displacing them from its regular class has a certain dollar value to it, but is worth, that is worth almost anything I've ever done. So the teachers, we need to use them the, you know, to their capacities. We need to fulfill them. Very important. You have a fulfilled school, a lot's going to happen that's good for the kids. A certain amount of freedom is necessary to create the conditions in which creativity can thrive. Are we willing to expand our view of what schools can look like? I laid out some of the problems for you. You heard about the school musical and the, and the grade requirement. You know about the bell schedules and the, and the limitations there. I mean, if we really are going to say we're going to play with space time, we've got to play with space time. We've got to do it right. We've got to keep all the other safety pieces in place. I know as parents, you know, we all want our kids to be safe in school, but at the same time, we want them to be happy in school too, and we want to give them some freedom. So we have to really consider that. And again, you know, in the pandemic, the things that I saw coming out of teachers were enormously creative. That had to be the hardest job in the world while you were in the pandemic, to be a teacher and try to keep this thing going in a hybrid way, or, and they had one kind of hybrid, and then they went back again, and then parents wouldn't send their kids to school. All these grades mattered, especially in high school with kids trying to get into colleges. They had to go into different grading systems. They ran with that the best they could. They were super creative and innovative. Is it possible to expand on that spirit because we were in an emergency? Can we use that as we inch forward into the future? I think that's, super, that's a super great question to ask, and I think I'd like to leave it basically at that. Can we use what we just learned, just last year and into this year, can we use it in a way that is really going to inform the education of the future? Because what I see, unfortunately, is a lot of people immediately try to recreate what they had before as we're trying to put this all back together, and I'm saying, oh, slow down. Can't we do this or that? And I'm not meeting a lot of our success with that. So it's just something to think about as we move forward, and if you guys have any influence when you're going to your local school districts or what you do, you know, make sure that all I ever use to be explored is all I'm saying. That's basically what this is all about. Teacher, last thing here is a teacher in creative mode on Halloween, also at graduation. So this is a teacher, this is a social studies teacher, um, department chair, a marvelously creative woman. She would teach European history and would dress up as Maria Antoinette and do all this, you know, just all this costuming long before she was at an art school because she had a great creative spark. And that's a beautiful costume. She, uh, this is actually a graduation day. And she's walking in there with this, 
I don't even know how to describe it, but it's something that is eye-catching, it's meaningful, and it, it's human. It's the human creative spirit that's coming out there in a really important way, and that's just a favorite image of someone who did a great job for 35 years for kids, and there needs to be honored for that. And as for me, what I'm doing these days, since I retired, I'm up in Nevada County, which is really different for me, coming from San Francisco and Alameda County. And um, so small, the county's got about 100,000 people. The, um, I'm working with the county superintendent there on about 11,000 student district. We wrote a strategic arts plan. We've done a couple of things. I'm also on a group, um, I'm the CFO of a group called Color Be Human, an anti-racist, equity-based uh, nonprofit that runs around training both educators and people in government on all the right things to do when it comes to a diverse workforce, which is not very diverse there, but we're getting them ready for the diversity that we think is going to come. So that's a really a lot of fun for me. I love being at a smaller scale now after having been at a really large scale. And that's my email address, if anybody ever want to contact me. And on medium.com, you can read a lot of my writings on subjects like this and other ones far and wide. And it's just a place where I get to express myself in a really meaningful way. And um, so, yeah, that's kind of it. So thank you. Thank you.